Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with luminary custom knife maker, Jim Burke. Burke has been a prominent player in the custom knife field since 2005. His folders blend the profile and build of a hard-use tactical folder with the touch, intricacy, and refinement of a gentleman's folder. While his fixed blade knives sport a stout, handsome look built rough and ready for battlefield and hunting camp alike. He's expanded his own product line and has collaborated with Boker uh, on their popular Hitman folder a few years back, a big, beautiful frame lock that was released to great reviews. Jim's knife designs and career are greatly informed by his years as a law enforcement officer and then doing other adrenaline pumping forms of service uh, that followed after that, which I can't wait to hear all about. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell so you, you find out when we upload new videos. And uh, you can also listen to us on all your favorite podcast apps. And if you think what we do here is valuable and you want to help support the show, you can do it by going to Patreon. The quickest way to do that is to go to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, I will repeat that very long address. It's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Now in its 42nd edition, Knives 2022 is the annual showcase of the most remarkable custom and factory manufactured knives in one remarkable collection. Get your copy today at thenifejunkie.com slash knives 2022. Jim, welcome to the Knife Junkie podcast, sir. How you doing this evening, man? Good to be here. Oh man, I'm doing great. It's good to good to have you here. We had a we had a nice little conversation on the phone last night, which is man, it's always a, a pleasure to do that when I get the chance, uh, just to find out a little bit about people. And man, I found out just the tip of the iceberg, but I could tell that it's an iceberg down there, man. Um, so it's great to have you on. I've been an admirer of your knife for uh, of your knives for a long, long time. And uh, after we stop rolling and no one is watching, I'll tell you exactly what I want someday from you. <laughs> outstanding, outstanding. But what I really, uh, what really fascinated me yesterday from our conversation was how much your law enforcement past uh, influenced your, your knife making. So tell me about, tell me about that. And then we'll go back to your first <laughs> knife. Uh, well, that's actually where it really all started. Um, I was looking for a better knife. Uh, what I particularly wanted to carry is really what it was. Um, you know, like we spoke about, I had a few that I tried and, uh, I just kind of made the decision that I could, uh, make what I wanted. And, um, that just kind of took it, took it, you know, it, uh, went from there and, uh, started out there and made one for myself and and then just the evolution of design in that particular knife um kicked in of course you know it, it was a uh liner lock back then because that's what you know predominantly was on the market and i like them i like the because they're a uh, true one-handed knife so that was my that was my goal and uh we got uh you know just kind of kicked it off right there i just wanted what i wanted and i was the only one who could make it so this is uh after you started uh as a law enforcement officer um in what i read and what you and i discussed you uh you realized immediately this is uh, an occupation where you need a a damn good knife what 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 did you design these knives for uh, the first folders were for pretty much everything, but um, in a situation where I would put myself in or would be put into, um, you're going to need to do utility tasks, obviously, cutting seat belts, um, cutting zip ties, right? Uh, you know, number of cutting tasks like that. And then um, I've always been a student of the knife. Um, even before I got in law enforcement um, training and I was actually an instructor at the law enforcement level of knife defense. And it, I always try to blend a equal amount of utility and a defensive uh, capability into a knife. 
What was the kind of uh, what were the kind of um, classes or techniques you were teaching when you were uh, a trainer for this kind of stuff? Back then, and it's not so much now, back then there was a, a large system of defensive tactics as a whole called PPCT. And um, and it encompassed everything. It encompassed uh, hand-to-hand defensive tactics, um, weapon tactics, uh, knife tactics, baton tactics, uh, all of it together. But I was just drawn to the blade side of it. Yeah. And it it is like um I would just venture to say like 85% of every knife system that is out there today it was based on Filipino. Um it's just cuz it the system is just uh, it is what it is. It's the best in the world. Um so it was all derived from that and the majority of what we taught was how to get cut less. Hmm. That's a, you know, that's just the simplest way to put it. Because if you're ever in an altercation with a knife, um, a serious altercation um, where you got to go hand to hand, you might as well accept it right out of the gate. You're going to take a cut. So, um, and my instructor actually had trained under some guys, um, that we were able to take it a step further than that for some special, um, special clientele, so to speak, and step it up to, um, I'd call it a level one system, you know, getting into lines and checks and passes and, um, uh, things like that for actual, just for instance, if you're in a situation where your gun is being compromised and you got to go to a blade, so you know how to use it. Okay. All right. Yeah, that that's what I was going to get to. This escalation of force or this idea of going from, uh, you know, uh, verbal verbal mm-hmm. uh, um, interdiction to, you know, hands-on to grappling yep. to and, – and that escalation of force, that's got to be it, – it, it's always – I got to say, like, uh, I, I, you know, just in a, in a very theoretical way – have done uh, knife training in Kali, you know, Eno Santo, La Kali, mm-hmm, Kali mm-hmm. Pakiti Tertia. Uh, but I, I, unlike you, did never even, you know, was out there to to functionalize it or or to make sure it worked. Thank God. I mean, for me anyway, uh, and the other yeah. guy, of course. But <laughs> right, uh, absolutely. But this concept of uh, of using a blade as opposed to almost everything else is anathema to people. You know, it's it's almost more acceptable to shoot someone than to stab them. Oh, because it's ugly. Uh, plain and simply, it's a. I, it, it, if you've ever seen it, um, I have on on multiple occasions a bladed attack or the aftermath of mm-hmm. a bladed attack and actual actual hands on as well. Just to be honest, and it's very ugly. It's it's not pretty. It's not uh, gunshot wounds are horrible. They're absolutely horrible, but when you rip into somebody or you get ripped into with a blade, it's, uh, it's horrific. And you have to be of the mindset that that's, you got to fight through that. Okay. So we're going to, we're going to take that horrific image cause it is, but it, you know, if you're a knife guy, there is, or a, or a knife, uh, enthusiast, even if you're the most, uh, uh, you know, benign of collectors, those thoughts uh, occur to you, but I want to take those thoughts and bend them towards the beauty uh, of your knives. Okay. So, so you, you came up, uh, I know that uh, just from reading your bio, uh, you made your first knife at 15, you know, did, did a lot of hunting and outdoors stuff. You became a law enforcement officer. That's when, that's when you decided you need to start making it for your own occupation. Mm -hmm. But then at some point you started, you took these, these tactical knives and, and they started to become more and more beautiful, more and more intricate, more and more uh, refined and precise. H- how did that happen? Um, well, uh, I love, um, we hit on this a little last night. I love making the hardcore tactical stuff. Uh, that's my favorite. Um, I love making a, you, the true user, um, hardcore knife. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, you end up, especially when you enter into it as a, uh, 
a supplier, you know, custom maker, you're obviously you're going to have people that want pretty things uh, mm-hmm. that want things that they deem as uh, elegant. And when I was asked to do that for the first time, I actually found it fulfilling, extremely fulfilling. Um, because I realized that I actually like putting that layer of, of beauty on top of these tools, you know, purpose driven tools. And, uh, it just, uh, I just, it really kind of hit me and I liked it. So the first one led to the second one, just like all of them do, you know, and I found myself, uh, where I was trying to be more intricate with things. Uh, Of course that has, uh, over the years, it's, you know, went from one to, you know, a number one to a 10 on that level of me doing it just uh, out of uh, passion and, and, and design. Just me, like, I like to design, whether that is in the intricacy or the design itself, the usefulness of the design itself. You talk about at, when you were asked to start applying beauty as as one of the materials so to speak to your to your work and and uh, you found it fulfilling it almost sounds like you accidentally found a uh, a, a mode of expression that you didn't know was there that you already were doing absolutely absolutely it um i don't consider myself an artist uh, but i have people tell me all the time that some of the th- things I do are considered artwork and I don't really look at it that way. I just look at it as I just like to make these tools look nice. You know, something that somebody um, would like to display if they wanted to, you know, and um, it did. It felt I I really like putting that level into them, taking it to that level with them. Well, uh, so people who might not know your work might not be as familiar with your work. Uh, show something, uh, hold something up so we can uh, have, have a reference point. Well, I'll tell you my, uh, probably this folder I'm about to show you is one of my first, easily the first 10, maybe even the first five. And it, it uh, it actually did some time in Iraq in uh, 04. Um, but oh. this is an example of a what I consider to be a user grade tool. You know, your surfaces yes. are all blasted, and um, you know, and I'm a fan of Persian blades for many different reasons. Um, and the handle shape uh, actually the name of this folder was uh the utility number one that was the oh, name this okay and, so this uh, is the one that so, you ended up making oh, i'm sorry this is the one you ended up making for a whole bunch of your i made a few of these yeah there. okay yeah uh, i'm yes, sorry i interrupted I did, you there I did. uh there's no no it's fine that's just a that's an example of a folder and actually this one is a uh this is actually a titanium only liner lock um oh. and um it's uh there's a huge debate out there in the field on liner locks and frame locks for multiple reasons um i understand every single one of them but uh i have made excuse me i've had requests from operators to make both of them and uh this would be an example of one of my very early heavily used uh straight knives Oh, okay. Very nice bone and shape there. This actually was made for a a customer who was a uh, big into the knife, and you'll notice this knife's made from uh, quarter inch stock because he really liked to be able to direct the weight in his hand. He liked to have that mm-hmm. feel of the weight in his hand, you know, tip on target and, and, and move it with it like that and have a very good thumb placement on it. And, uh, uh, a lot of the things I do are, you know, it's for quick and easy, you know, reverse grip things like that. So that's just a couple of of examples of some of the early things that I did. 
Uh, you you mentioned uh, you're a big fan of the Persian blade. Why is that? Mm -hmm. You know, that blade is, uh, and there's many different kind of Persian style blades. Uh, the, the ones that are super upswept are not as useful. I like a medium sweep on the Persians I make because they're super useful blades. Uh, in just something as easy as sliding it under, if you think about it, which I don't recommend this, but it has happened. You know, you're out there on the street, you're trying to get a, a set of zip ties off of somebody. You ain't got your handy multi-tool with you that day. Uh, that blade is easily slipped under and easily get pop a set of zip ties off versus some other blade shapes that would be much harder to get in that small space between the skin and the zip tie. Um, you know, slipping it under a seat belt. I mean, the, the, it's just the, the shape of the blade allows it to be used in so many applications uh, defensively as well. Uh, reverse grip, you know, reverse situations. Um, I just think it, the blades uh, very underestimated. So you made that that model number one with that medium upswept and nicely swedged Persian blade. I mean, that's a beautiful looking blade. And then um, and you used it. You made some for for some of your fellow uh, law enforcement officers. Yeah, actually, and, I'm sorry. That one actually was in Iraq with a with a, uh, a friend of mine. Oh, OK. That was over there on tour. No, that wasn't me. That wasn't me. But he uh, uh, he used it for actually two tours over there. So, so, so how do you take the feedback or, or did you take the feedback from the people who got some of your very first knives and how did you move forward with uh, making your next knife and your next knife after that? Like, um, did, did you receive any feedback? I really like this knife, but maybe the tip is too Absolutely. Upswept, that kind of thing. Absolutely. Um, everybody loves that blade that I've ever put it in their hands. That's not, let me put it this way. You hand a guy a blade like that in a straight knife or a folder that doesn't, has never had a favorite. Who's not like, I got to have a Tonto. I got to have a Tonto from something that they've seen mm -hmm. and they haven't used it. You know, a, uh, how do I put it? A, uh, opinion based on non-use. Let's just say that if you hand that to a guy who doesn't have that, type of opinion i've never had any bad feedback never uh they just love them you know the only thing i'll say about that is uh like i said i'm a big guy a big fan of purpose-driven tools like you know that i'm not going to tell you to stick that in an ammo can right right you know that's not that kind of knife you know if you want that kind of knife we're obviously going to go with a little bit different blade shape, different, you know, uh, grind and a tip out on it and things like that. But this was a uh, strictly, uh, a, you know, a semi utility, um, if need be defensive blade that he could conceal very easily. Um, so it's the blade just serves so many different purposes, you know, and then, of course, you get into that purpose-driven thing. This was my carry knife. Uh, we talked about me being in D.C. Um, this was actually my carry knife. And this, again, is one of the first 10 to 12 folders that I made. But this was my carry knife oh, cool. um, that I carried for a long, long time. That's cool. That's a beaut. What's that called? That's actually a number. That's actually a number one utility, but it's got the long clip Bowie style blade in it. Okay. And is that uh, that's a liner lock too, right? It is. It is. It's semi liner lock. It's just got the hat, you know, three quarter on lathe on it. Um, you know, hundred thousandths liners. So um, yeah, it's a liner lock, but I just like thick liners. Okay, well, so how how do you how do you decide between a liner lock or a frame lock? Or I shouldn't say how do you decide. I guess I should say what what are your feelings and preferences? It seems like liner lock, uh, and and I've heard like I spoke with uh, Peter Carey on the show, mm -hmm. and, he, and and he is firmly in the liner lock lo, liner lock camp. Do you feel that way that strongly either way? 
it depends. Well, as far as I'm concerned, personally, using a knife, um, I've used a knife just so much that I'm not going to flaw with either one of them. Mm -hmm. But uh, someone who doesn't have a tremendous amount of experience handling a folder and they're looking to deploy it quickly, a frame lock's not their best option. Yeah. Because you know as well as I do, you get that pressure on that hand a little wrong, you push in on that bar a little too heavy, and you, you go to feed it or flip it, it uh, makes it a little tough. Yeah, it's almost for the not for the uninitiated, unless it's it got a speed safe assist or something. Uh, because, yeah, I, I remember when I yeah. first started getting into some of the knives, I was really coveting these uh, frame locks. I was having a hard time. And even with some of them now, if they're too shallow from from dorsal to pectoral side, you can't help but depress that yeah. lock bar. That's a big deal, too. Yeah. Um, OK, so uh, so yeah, I want to get an understanding. In... No, 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 please go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, like you said, it really is an experience level thing and it's about what you're comfortable with. And I definitely agree with the width of the knife. Uh, that does have a lot to do with it, uh, a, a lot to do with it, depending on yeah. your situation, you know. Yeah. And I know that uh, some uh, some outfits like Zero Tolerance attempted to overcome that. And I, I never actually experienced that knife. I can't remember what it was called. Uh, but but their whole, uh, you know, the whole reason they made that knife was to try and overcome the lock bar pressure thing. And I right. thought, oh, that's an interesting idea. But, you know, you could you could overcome that with design. Pocket clip. Yeah, exactly. easiest way to overcome it is with pocket clip. Man, it's just that simple. If uh, if you're trying to design a knife like that and its intended usage is, you know, if it if you really want it. Uh, to be able to be, you know, used at that level by people who aren't quite as experienced, then you design the pocket clip into it where it covers up over half of the lock slot. And, and then, you know, it's the same time, half of the width and you're safe because that's the go-to spot for the hand on, them, you know? Right, right. Those, those uh, last three fingers are always there anyway. So you take the mm -hmm. pressure off that way. That's right. Okay, so I, I want to get an understanding of how you're. Um, you, I, I don't mean old because you're younger than I am, uh, but <laughs> you're 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 an old name in in the game. Okay, uh, you've been around right. in the in the custom folder, tactical folder, and and fixed blade game for a long time. Um, how did how did it happen that you went from uh, you know, went from someone just making knives for yourself and then for people uh, like you that you knew to someone who was selling knives and uh, and looking to the future to make a living this way. I, uh, well, it, from exactly what you're saying, I, I was making knives for people in the community. Um, and I... I did a lot of training at a place in uh, West Memphis, Arkansas, uh, way out in the cotton field um, that it, uh, formerly known as uh, T's Tactical Explosives Entry School. And I was out there a lot. And the owner of that business uh, saw that I had a knife of my own, was very interested and um he wanted me to make him one so i did folder and a straight blade and then he showed it off and i started getting calls about making knives and i was like no i can't you know i can't do that right now uh, i was still in the job and i just started doing it a little bit providing knives to certain people making a few more here a few more there and it just elevated and went from a few to, to a few more. And then, um, I just saw the ability to uh, be able to transition, uh, because like we spoke about the, uh, the scale here, um, for law enforcement is not, not the highest on the map. Mm -hmm. Um, 
and uh, I, I saw an opportunity to do that and do more of the contract work as well. And it just, uh, it was just a transition, you know, it was, um, that's it. Just make a few more and a few more. And then it just turned it, it just kind of natural transition into it. I really hated to get out of law enforcement. I did, um, many brothers all through the field, 11 years in. Um, but at the same time, you know, it was a good opportunity in mm -hmm. both worlds. So I just kind of jumped on it. That that's gotta be a, uh, you know, a, a real, uh, intersection in life. You know, you, you're doing something that you know and love and that you know really well for a long period of time. Uh, but you're also doing something else parallel to that. And maybe that thing is even closer to your heart. And there comes a time when you have to, you know, where those two lines are going to cross. They're not exactly parallel. Yeah. And eventually right. they're going to cross and, and you're going to have to make a decision. And the to me, it seems like the most harrowing thing is when you make that decision. Uh, very much so. Um, the unsurety of it, like we talked about, I got I got buddies uh, that are retired, have retired in the last couple of years. And I, I do look at that. <laughs> Oddly enough, you know, I look at it and I'm like, well, I would have been retired, uh, I don't know, probably five years ago. And uh, but at the same time, I don't regret my decision. Um, it's it's it uh, has supported and does support two kids. And uh, I have a, made a huge amount of wonderful friends in this community that are equally um, embedded like I am on the other side of this thing. And it's an amazing place. The knife community itself is just a, just a crazily amazing um, place. It really is. You know, I mean, you go to the blade show and, you know, God rest his soul, you know, Dick Marcinko's there, you know, back in the day. And, you right. know, just, I can't tell you how many other people I ran into, you know, in the community. It just, uh, and it just fit, you know, once I went in 2003, when I walked through the doors at Blade Show, I had a box with about four knives in it just to show people uh, and ran into, you know, I mean, it was just, a, it was a good fit, felt good. Yeah, it seems like something that uh, you don't really retire from. I mean, you might slow down in making knives or you might, you might eventually stop altogether, but, um, you know, like a job out in the private sector where you're working like my job or like your job was it comes mm -hmm. to a finishing point and you, and you know okay i'm done with this yeah. now it's time for my golden years but something like this it never stops you are never going to be probably never going to be satisfied completely with your knives you will always have a reason to make another one and it's not just to fill an order right uh, evolution it's evolution of the knife you know um everything about it um, the, the, the usefulness of it, uh, the way it looks, um, elegance of design, which like we, like when I first started out, I, I was worried about, I wanted, it was a purpose there, you know, the designs are still purpose driven, but I also look now at the elegance of the design versus just that purpose driven, uh, part of it. You know, I want it to all flow together now. How does your design process work and how does it uh, how does it eventually evolve into the building process? Uh, well, I'm I'm, uh, I'm not like some other makers. I don't sit down with a uh, sketch pad and draw stuff up. Uh, I may have a sheet of paper that I sketch something out on that nobody else can recognize because I'm not a great drawer, but um, I will sit down and think of everything I want to go into the knife first. And then the other thing I always look at is obviously I want the knife to have certain most knives. Now my slip joints, that's a different animal. That's a completely, that's a different world. That's a different animal. That's my father's world. That's a pocket tool. That's a different 
it's a different thing. But my tactical folders all have, if you'll notice, they all have certain characteristics. Um, the mechanic B, um, this is this is one of the mechanic B, the one of my newer models, and I have a mechanic. It was a hog bill, and then oh, I yeah. have the mechanic. Hold it up. Let's see that oh, beauty. Yeah. Oh, let yeah, yeah. Let's see that. Put that right up to your camera, because this is the one I'm gonna get someday. I love this knife. Dear oh, God, get it over in frame. Man. Look at that little Westinghouse Backside. micarta. Actually, Send that's a, a slab uh, carbon fiber. That's your, oh no uh, no no I know, but I, I've seen you do this. Oh, you want? Oh yes. Oh, absolutely. I'm a, <laughs> I am a I am a nut over Westinghouse because uh, it's gorgeous. just uh, micarta is uh, especially canvas micarta. You know, I can get all the blood I want on it. I can put fifty weight motor oil on it, and it still is not going to slip out of my hand if it's finished for that if it's finished to be used. Right. Right. Um, you, you know, and, uh, it's, it's, you, you just, the only thing you can do to it's really burn it to, to tear it up, you know, yep. and that's just one of my favorite materials in the world. Um, but this knife, one of the things I was going to, is, is, is about every knife that I make, it, you know, you're going to be able to butt strike with it. You know, it's going to be, it's going to be fairly easy to reverse grip. You know, and you'll have a, that purchase on the rear end of it. And it, it's just, you know, it, it's uh, it's made to be used in every every application uh, fits in the hand. Well, you know, try to meet up with all. And I have a very I have a very large hand. So it's, uh, you know, for me to make an, <laughs> for me to make a knife that fits everybody else and myself. Now, that's where the challenge really is. But uh, so these qualities, it's all certain qualities in a knife. OK, uh, hold, hold it back up and show me the handle again real quick. So you, you just address something specifically that few people do that uh, I'm, I'm happy you mentioned. Uh, and that's about the pommel of this handle. Mm. Uh, you you mentioned it as, uh, you know, you, you can use it for butt strikes. So I'm assuming that you mean it's long enough because what I love about this pommel is that it's not pointed. It's faceted so that your mm -hmm. thumb can hook over it uh, in, but the, in a reverse, reverse grip. You want to be able to get that purchase on it right there without having something that's poking through your thumb. It's which is going to tear up your. Yes. Yeah. But. Yeah. So I, I love that aspect. That's something that's a little uh, uh, design pet peeve. I, I'm not crazy about really sharp, pointy pommels. So I'm like, mm -hmm. really like someone to pull off a puño strike is highly less likely than someone just using the blade. So just make it so we can use the blade first. Uh, so I like, I like that you got the room for that kind of strike, but it's not mm -hmm. uncomfortable to the thumb in reverse grip. Right. Right. And, and you know, that's in your bigger, obviously that's in your knives that are that size that you can really get that kind of usage out of, you know, smaller knives per se. Um, I make some smaller knives, my, my grunt and a few smaller knives, but, and I hate, I really hate to just say this, but they're just pocket knives. I mean, they're utility, plain and simple. Smaller sure. knives are, you, you, they're utility. They're, they're easy to carry. Um, they're politically correct and they're plain and simply they're for opening boxes and, right. you know, shit like that. But <laughs> so... Yeah. Totally, one hundred percent useful and legitimate uh, uh, kind of kind of knife to make. Obviously, um, yeah. I, I tend towards the <laughs> the mechanic B, but I, yes. I I also have a collection of slip joints. I love slip joints, and we'll talk about the Rebel in a minute. But I I want to get to um, so you you're talking about your design is kind of an organic mm -hmm. process. You don't really necessarily sketch it down, mm -hmm. uh, but <clears throat> but you kind of go to the shop and you start working. Mm -hmm. And things evolve yeah. from there. Tell me oh, about your man. shop, and tell me time. Tell me about your uh, your in shop. You know, life. What what's it like? Well, that's a great question. It's a bit odd. I live in it, um, <laughs> so uh, I actually live in my shop. Um, so I'm here, you know, a lot, and <laughs> that leads to a lot of work hours. Um, 
And as far as design goes, I can spend, because after I get something in my head, I'll go straight to the computer, pull up the CAD, and I'll just start creating arcs and lines. I'll just start creating them, cutting them, wiping them, creating them, printing it out, cutting it up with scissors, looking at it, laying it out on a piece of cardboard, um, seeing if it's going to feel correct. And that literally that process can take a couple days. Uh, on a, any particular knife. It just depends on how fast it's flowing and how much I'm liking of what I'm doing and what I'm seeing. But it can be quite a long process to get a knife off the board is what I call it. And uh, of course, then you go into prototyping. But uh, yeah, so, you know, um, it you start, you know, like with the mechanic B, you know, it'll take a couple of days to get it up get it off the board, get it into prototyping. And then, you know, um, I do everything in house heat treat, all that's done right here. Um, so it's just, uh, it's a, it's a long process to get to that point where I can build three or four at a time. Okay. Uh, what I don't get is this, uh, you, you go to uh, CAD and you work it out in CAD. Do you mm -hmm. then, do you then have a, do you put it in a CNC mill or is the CAD just to work out the mechanics? Oh, no, no. I cut, I cut my 2D blanks out in a CNC. Okay. Um, Cause uh, everything, everything here is hand ground. All the locks are hand fitted uh, on a lock grinding fixture that I'm almost positive that my dad developed first way, way, way back. Um, <laughs> just saying. Uh, but, uh, every, so everything contouring, uh, you know, all that, but my main goal in CNC was to be able to have repeatable blanks. Okay. So that if there was an issue with a blade, I didn't have to, it wasn't such a horrible process to get another blade back in the frames and get it laying right and fit it up right. Like I actually drew it up to be. So the two dimensional blanks are my, that's where my CNC is. That's the big thing. And of course I do carve some pivots. I do some specialty pivots on it mm -hmm. and things like that. Yeah. But I take it right off the, the computer onto a printout, a cutout. And then we go to, we go to making a fixture and getting some two dimensional parts at that point. I like how uh, I, I understand and, of, of course, appreciate how factories and big operations use CNC mills and EDMs and all that. But I, I really uh, think it's interesting how how uh, custom knife makers and independent makers use CNCs. And, and I find that they use them in different ways to two mm -hmm. different extents. And to me, uh, you know, I like the way you use it. You're, you're kind of like having the mill take care of these the mundane things right. and and in the mundane is where you make mistakes you know and and so you could mess up making a blank and that's man that's messing up at, at the wrong part of the not that Ooh. any 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 time is good but i could see why you yeah. use that a repeatable process and don't let anybody tell you they don't mess up grinding blades <laughs> they always turn out right because and uh you know it happens and bad day couple blades down, oh, you know, and that's just hours and hours of refitment. If you can't take a two dimensional part that already lines up in your open and closed position, um, you know, that's a big deal. That's a huge thing. That was my main goal with CNC was plain and simply to have two dimensional parts that I could reach from once I had a design that I liked and then build you know, build on to it, you know, um, I mean, you can cut out your overlays with it. You get your two dimensional blanks. It, it's really no different. I don't use it any differently than a pantograph, you know, a lot okay. of the, well, yeah. not a lot anymore, but the, you know, Alan Elishowitz is a freaking huge fan of the pantograph and he is very yeah. good with it. Like very good. Alan's a different, he's a different breed. I love him to death. He is so driven. Um, you know, uh, just knowledgeable on everything, but, uh, okay. he is a, you, you know, and I, and honestly, um, Alan and I talked for a long time before I went into a CNC about going with a pantograph. And by the time all the pros and cons were weighed, uh, the clear choice uh, was the CNC. And one of the big reasons was 
being able to draw on the software because being able to proof a knife mm -hmm. in open and closed position and know how to draw that is a huge benefit. It's just a huge benefit versus, you know, you're drawing it on paper and you're trying to arc it out and use all these drawing tools and things. And, you know, it's just never quite the same because what that thing, how it opens and closes in that program, is exactly what it's going to do if you do your machine work right. Right. <laughs> yeah. That seems to me like, like, even if you're the, even if you're the biggest, uh, you know, uh, CAD, um, uh, skeptic, it seems like that would be, uh, the number one reason it's for, for the, all of that lock and, and, um, swiveling mm -hmm. geometry. It seems like you know, without that, or, or without a real working model, whether it's paper or whatever, but still, you mm -hmm. know, if it's in the computer and it's in that program, it's going to be, it's going to be right on. So yes. you, you, you mentioned something uh, that you kind of glazed over that I want to, I want to, ask you about you said that your father you're pretty sure your father invented uh this uh fixture <laughs> for, for uh for lock wow. face Inter so uh tell me about your father's involvement in your knife making oh uh, uh even today hugely beneficial involved um i'm not a machine mechanic now by any shape fashion or form uh, but my father was a uh, auto mechanic for the better part of his life. And then uh, he worked for General Motors as a machine mechanic until he retired. So my old man can work on pretty much anything. So he, <laughs> he keeps his place up and running. And uh, he, when I was probably, I guess I remember I was probably 12, 13 years old when he I don't have no idea how my uncle got into knife making, but my dad saw it. It intrigued him. He wanted to make a straight knife. Uh, he comes home, he builds a grinder, um, and uh, two by back then it was a not a 72, but a 42. And, uh, you know, builds a grinder and starts delving into the straight knife stuff. And, uh, you know, when I was 15, I, took a little interest into it because I really wanted a big Bowie knife. You know, I wanted, I was a, you know, crocodile Dundee kind of stuff. Oh yeah. And, uh, so, uh, I, you know, we got some metal and we made it and, um, that's where I started. That's really where it, that's where the, the process of making started right there. Cause uh, it intrigued me that if I wanted it, I could make it. And, uh, he helped you develop your first liner lock, right? The first couple of prototypes. He did. he did. Boy, and I tell you what, that was a process. We fought like cats and dogs. <laughs> Cause I had, uh, <laughs> you know, I had ideas and he, uh, he had ideas and, uh, but, uh, uh, through all of it, we got it done. And, uh, it just showed me back then how, um, you know, you, uh, in order to do anything, you got to have some specialty tools. Um, you just do. Yeah, and uh, the old man was really good at making them. He still is. Uh, what What were you going on? What were you using as your model? Were you, did you take apart knives that you already liked? And well, kind of you know, back engineer. I'm not going to mention the name of it, but I had that one that we talked about, mm -hmm. and uh, I didn't take it apart actually because I sent it back. Um, but I looked in it with a flashlight and got a, the knowledge that I thought. I needed out of it. And that's when I started finding, cause, cause back then they were very obscure. It was hard to find a blade magazine. It was hard to find mm -hmm. those Mac, you know, and, but I actually found one. And that's when I started wondering, where do you buy this stuff to put, where do you get Nylotron? I didn't know what Nylotron was, you know, I mean, yeah. where do you, where do you get, you know, this and that and the other. And I found a very obscure ad in the back for a guy out of Florida, uh, you, you know, Reese and, uh, oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, back then, man, he was a supplier and, uh, I mean, we're talking in, uh, we're talking in 94, 94, man, uh, 95. Like, so oh, and it, I remember it wasn't well. like it. It wasn't like it is now. You know, you didn't just you didn't just roll up and 
call up on the phone and order some screws. It, it was uh, kind of hard to find if you didn't know exactly what you were looking for. But so I had to go through all those processes of finding this stuff and figuring it out and learning how to set a detent ball. I mean, I saw what was in there. And honestly, this is going to sound really dumb, but I was always under the impression that a detent ball rolled. Oh, okay. I mean, why, Probably. why would, why wouldn't you assume that? What, you know, it, I, I can see that's not like a crazy assumption. Uh, you know, and, um, it took a little while to figure that out, uh, process of making. And my dad was like, these things don't roll. Dude. <laughs> like, and I'm like, how do I make it roll? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, it's supposed to roll. He's like, no, 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 it doesn't roll. And anyway, so it's just stuff like that, that I had to go through and figuring it out. And, um, we, we beat all that stuff down. I mean, you know, it took a lot of, uh, it took a, and back then there was nobody. I had nobody. It was me and him. Uh, nobody showed me anything. Uh, nobody here in the great state of Mississippi or in the surrounding, you know, three states that I knew of that I could call about knife stuff. It was plain and simply on me and him to figure it out. And we did. So by the time I actually got into it a little bit and suppliers started popping up, because I'd get a few more magazines. They were a little more available. And, uh, you know, of course, we're talking over the next five years, basically. And uh, so that's just kind of how that all all went out. Well, we were, I mean, even I uh, really take for granted, you know, and I like to, I like to say to my daughters, ah, oh, this social media, but we take we we take it for granted. I like to I like to, as an old man. I like to I like to run it down. But I'm I'm somewhat dependent on it, especially with this podcast. And um, I I know that a lot of knife makers are dependent on um, Instagram, say because it's a visual medium. It's easy to or, or it's an it, it's a very uh, upfront way to sell your work to get it in front of people. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with YouTube and learning how to make knives. Now, if you want to learn how to make knives you have a university online. Of course, you don't have the hands-on, you don't have the mentorship, and that that is something to be sure. But when you were hacking this out with your father, I mean, some people listening might forget that you couldn't just go to the computer because it wasn't there. Yeah. <laughs> you couldn't yeah, just go to YouTube because it's not existing. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, okay, I, I mentioned I mentioned YouTube, and yeah, I heard a little groan. What what was that about? Well, I just, uh, I'm, I'm old, um, you know, we're, we're, we're at that age and uh you know we grew up back then we grew yeah. up in that era where hey look if somebody wanted to get in touch with you there wasn't a cell phone if you wasn't at home nobody got in touch with you you know what yep. i mean yep i mean i remember there were no answering machines you know if you weren't there when the phone rang well you know you just didn't uh, didn't get nobody got talked to you and uh it's kind of the same thing with earning your stripes i guess because i grew up in that world I grew up in that world with everything and law enforcement and uh, other community and uh, and in knife making where you earned your own stripes, man. You know, nobody gave that to you. I remember the first thing Tom Mayo ever told me 2003. I showed him one of my knives. He said, kid, can you get your job back or whatever? <laughs> something like that. You know, <laughs> actually, I'm sorry. It wasn't in 03. It was uh, I met him in 03. And he told me, don't quit my job. Don't That's quit your day was. job, kid. <laughs> don't quit your day job, kid. He said, don't do it. He said, you'll regret it. And uh, then a few years later, he said, can you get your job back? <laughs> oh, Manaj. That is I love harsh. It. I harsh, love Tom. But... Tom's, hey, you know, it is what it is. But that whole earning your, you know, beating it out, walking through it, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, I feel like. Anyway, I won't get all off on that. I'll just say it's a very easy now to pop up the old YouTube. If you want to learn how to grind, then it'll, you know, you, all the processes are right there for you to see. Okay. So, so I went through art school. Okay. So you could, you could probably argue the same thing. You could go to YouTube and learn how to draw, um, you know, and, and, you're, you're, you know, depending on your natural talent, you know, become a good artist or whatever. Uh, but there is something about being about hacking it out like you did, like I did in school and, and mm -hmm. under the tutelage of actual real people. Um, 
but uh, the idea of of, of uh, just kind of popping onto the scene. I mean, uh, I, I I am I am totally. I don't know. I, I have uh, two different feelings about this because uh, I love the knives that are coming out of everywhere, um, mm -hmm. whether they're um, uh, people who are making them in their shops or people who are designing them and having them made. I'm just kind of a, a fan of all of them. But um, it's interesting to think about how this all comes together right now. Right. Right. It's. Uh... I'm uh, I sound very. Uh... Like I said, I am a fan of earning your stripes. I really am. But at the same time, um, I don't, I will help, you know, I've had many people ask me for help and I'm all about giving it to them. Uh, I, I'm all about it. Like, I, I feel like that if you can't share with people in this community, then you're really not doing, you know, what you, uh, you're not doing what you're supposed to just like with most things in life. And, uh, you know, but I'm like you. I got that old part of my brain that's going like, eh, not gonna earn it. you know, that kind <laughs> of thing, you know, I mean, maybe that's a, you know, that's a, my granddaddy coming out and whatever, but it, you know, I, I, I'm like you, I feel like the age of information is not a bad thing. I just happened to come up in an age of no information. Yeah. It's just not everything. Yeah. Right. No information. <laughs> yeah. So, so just like you said, you're willing to share and that's what I hear from everyone. And that's like, uh, ev everyone that I speak to on this show has had someone show them, uh, some generosity of knowledge. And that's a beautiful thing. You know, you could teach me how Jim Burke makes a knife and I will never make a Jim Burke knife. And you know that that's why you're probably willing to share your knowledge. And, uh, but the flip side of that is the part that I think is missing from just learning from YouTube University. And that is what Tom Mayo was giving you, which is criticism mm. and, and constructive yeah, criticism, not just like you suck, but constructive criticism uh, is yeah. so valuable in becoming good at whatever you're doing creatively. Absolutely. And uh, well, it's uh, he, uh, you got to be real careful given that these days. Um, constructive or not you know it's uh but i would feel like in our world it's well accepted you know um i feel like anybody who wants to become i got a guy i'm training right now actually uh have been working with him for about a year um he's on straight knives and uh he calls me drill sergeant that's what he says he's like when you're in drill sergeant mode let me come over and, and i'm like you know because I'm, I'm hard on you know, I'm like, pay attention. Don't ask me this question again. I'm showing you now. Don't ask me again. You know, uh, that kind of thing. But uh, he's coming along real good. And uh, I, I love it, actually. I actually love teaching. Um, that was a big in law enforcement. I was an instructor in, in many different levels of, of things. And, uh, you know, it's it's a good feeling when you can show someone something and they appreciate it and they learn from it they they benefit from it it's a great feeling it's uh it's it's in a way like having a child you know you you uh you go you go through your own childhood and then you go through your young adulthood and all of its pain and tribulation and then when you have children you're like i can pass this along to you you know don't ever do this or or definitely <laughs> do this or do this but in moderation um but but uh yeah. So, so passing along that knowledge, I mean, imagine you've spent all this time cultivating a career, learning how to make knives, every knife better than the last one, you know, and, and the ones that aren't get trashed and we never see those, but every knife better mm -hmm. than the last one. And then to end, end your career end your life without having passed that knowledge on to further knives would be a shame. It would. And, um, that's why I don't mind it. My son, um, He's uh, not making knives now because uh, I told him plain and simply, I said, uh, well, your option is to get your college degree. And as soon as you do that, if you want to make knives, you come on back and we'll get at it. But go get your college degree first, you know. Um, but it's uh, I love to teach people. I love to show them. I love to collaborate. I love to share knowledge. Uh, you know, I'm one of these people who. If I'm not learning, I'm stagnant. Oh yeah, I I, I really am. Um, you know, and I'm not somebody who I'm I'm here to learn. 
if you got something to show me, I want to see it. I need to know it. And uh, if I'm working with someone like that, I'm all in. It's just that simple. I mentioned in the intro that you, uh, you know, you worked with Boker and and they, they produced your, your uh, uh, Hitman design. What, what mm. other, um, which is a really cool knife, but what other uh, collaborations have you done? Uh, actually, Boker's the only one. Uh, we did a few, we did the Hitman. We did the Resurrection way back when. Um, and uh, we did my Carnivore entry. Um Hatchet, uh, um, Tomahawk, um, and um, a multi, a little small tool of mine, a pocket tool. And um, that's about it, really, actually. I haven't been in the uh, – when I say collaborate, I'm t- I mean with other makers. As far as my collaboration with Factories, Boker's been the only thing that I've done. Okay, yeah, but in terms of the other makers, what what other makers have you uh, have you made oh. stuff with? And, and what's it like? I mean, it's got to be way different than collaborating with Boker. Oh, 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 yeah. Um, factories are completely, yeah. That's a whole different. That's a different animal, a uh, different thing. It's, uh, but makers are amazing. Um, Jeremy Marsh and <laughs> we've been <laughs> we've been friends for a long time. And uh, he, I love him. He uh, we get along so well, and he comes down twice a year, and we'll make a run of knives and do it up and stay up <laughs> days on end building knives. You know, for four or five days at a time. And uh, he's a big fan of craft beer, by the way. So <laughs> <laughs> that sounds so fun. <laughs> oh yeah, man, it's great. And uh, we we come up with some really, really cool stuff. And then me and Lee Williams, um, we've done the kickstop. Uh, we did the kickstop rebel. We did the kickstop Hitman, And, uh, you know, back when w- way back when, uh, back, you know, if, if you were going to say, I guess my first, my first introduction to actual, instruction on a knife hands-on instruction was way far into my career and that was when me and neil blackwood uh had gotten to be such good friends and he would come and stay with me at my shop once a year for probably i don't know five years and we would do something together we'd do a collaboration together and um it's just amazing you know um the hands-on stuff like that is just the fun in it is just you can't outweigh it. it's just it's amazing it's it's awesome so, right and and to work with another creative person another knife maker as opposed to um as opposed to a factory who's just like trying to get your design right and that's i'm sure that's cool in its own its own way but yeah. that collaboration it's like being in a band it's like making a song except the song well, is a knife and every maker's better at something than another one. I mean, anybody who doesn't tell you okay. that, like uh, Marsh is, his, uh, he's an artist. No, he's an artist, plain and simple. Because before he got into the gentleman tactical stuff, he actually did art knives. Um, Neil was a, a machinist, like a full on, full. Of course, Marsh was a tool and die maker. He was a machinist. Neil mm-hmm. was a, a big, to and die machinist uh, went to switzerland to study and stuff so his uh his ideas about you know things it just it all forms from that you know and um he uh, is probably one of the top five grinders on the face of the planet period paragraph um you know brand as everybody says mm, yeah, yeah. walter's probably you know i mean he's one or two for sure um, but Neil, um, back then was, he was top five easily. Those big swooping grinds with those rolling shoulders. And that's actually where I, when I do my recurves, that's, that's where I learned that. That's where I got learned really how to get into grinding was through Neil uh, and many years of many buckets, five gallon buckets of scrap blades. So. Oh man, you mentioned Walter Brend and and yeah. 
uh, to me, he's uh, uh, he's he's in my top five of uh, fixed blade custom knives that I'd love to have, or at least check out before I kick the bucket. Because oh, yeah. oh, oh yeah. man, they just they just sing to me. I, I love Walter Brand knives. They're beautiful, yeah. Yeah, beautiful pieces. Uh, and he and Walter also is a very good. Uh, well, he's a a hundred percent professional at, at braving guards. Oh, okay. Uh, and when you're making fixed blades like he makes, that's a huge thing. You either have to be a great machinist to fit those guards up almost seamlessly, or either you got to be good at brazing those guards on. And right, Walter right. can brave, man. I mean, his stuff just, you know, I mean, he's been doing it forever too, you know, making uh, those particular things and he's just he's the man when it comes to that so in closing jim i mean now we're talking about some 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 old names we talked about some new names and new um processes and kind of the way things are how how would you compare the knife world when you came into the game to the knife world today wow it's a great question you know my dear friend, Kit Carson, which was another one of my mentors. Um, we had a long discussion about this years ago. Um, God rest his soul. Um, it's an evolution of things. You, you can't really. Um, the earliest thing I remember as far as the Internet is like blade forums like we talked about. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, back then you did have MySpace, but that was, I say back then, that ain't that far back then, you know. Um, you had your MySpace page, which people started advertising on. I, I feel like that the difference is, and it's like Ken Onion and, and, and Kit. Uh, they said, you know, you go to a show, you get to that table when it opens and you leave when it closes. You stay at the show every, every day, all day. The industry is not that anymore, if that makes sense. The industry is primarily done on social media. Uh, makers go to shows. People come see them. But your, your accountability for face-to-face -face is not as heavy as it used to be. It is, it's social media. It's, uh, it's really kind of hard. It's kind of hard to really, you know, it's, it's just, uh, I don't want to say the wrong thing here. Well, I, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, 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 no. I'm sorry. I interrupted you. Yeah. You're about to say the wrong thing and I want to hear it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 we talked about collectors, yeah. um, true collectors of knives. You know, um, I think that has a lot to do with the old school, the old world in this industry as well. Um, social media changed a lot of that. Um, it makes it easier to uh, uh, just plain and simply, it makes it easier to get into it, makes it easier to get fame was quick it makes it easier to you know uh, a lot of things and that's not always good sometimes i'll just say that yeah no i i got you I, that that's the same with any industry for sure i mean uh in the industry i i work in it's kind of similar um and 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 everywhere you go but um i think though the one thing that doesn't change uh whether it's the old format, the new format, and there will be a, another format uh, for whom for the sure. people, the, for whom the people who came up on Instagram will be like, ah, I used to sell my knives on Instagram. Now there's this uh, uh, <laughs> virtual beta world or whatever the hell they're calling it. And, you know, I don't know how <laughs> yeah. to operate there, but, but the thing that, that hasn't changed and won't change is customer service. If people are laying down Jim Burke money, they want to know that Jim Burke cares, you know? So, so really that's, that's what it is. But I get you um about the social media stuff it, you cannot decide what grips you and if social media does not grip you it's a chore uh you know so yeah but you know we we all have to do our chores and such but but man yeah it it, it seems like it's uh social media has made things easier 
And then maybe in a way uh, they've made things harder just in that um, there's now a flood. You know, there's there's yeah. now just a bigger pool. And you got to stay on top of it, like you said. You know, me being old school, man, I have a hard time with social media. I have a hard time, you know, checking, you know, checking that phone every 45 minutes to yeah. an hour, making sure I'm putting a pickup. And I really need to because I really want everybody to see um, you know, I, uh, to see, you know, I, I wanted, you know, and that's, uh, for an old head like me, it's kind of hard to do, you know, I'm getting better at it though. So, uh, what are your goals for the coming uh, few years? What, what kind of things do you want to, uh, uh, conquer in the next coming years? Uh, uh, well, I would really like to do another, um, I really want to step back a little bit into that. I'd like to do a, a user grade run, mm. if that makes sense. I'd oh, yeah. really like to do a user grade run of a particular knife. Um, and, you know, that has its own challenges these days. Um, but I'd really like to do that. And I would like to just keep refining my process, basically. That's the main thing always refine my process and uh i really want to i'm fixing to start doing some more straight knives okay i'm fixing to uh i'm gonna kind of step back to the roots a little bit and do a few more straight knives because uh i've got a few of the things that uh that i do like uh let me grab this one too like this knife has been very, uh, very popular and it is my basic. That's the name of the knife is the basic. And it is a basic straight uh, knife. Now this one actually has got a little sweep for a recurve in it, but the standard ones don't. They're flat. It's a flat straight edge. It is a, it is a basic straight knife that works in every situation. I've got skinners that are using, I got guys that are using it skinning multiple whitetail with it i've got guys that are carrying them overseas uh it, the knife works for anything you want to do with it it's a basic straight knife and uh i really you know i i enjoy doing things like that um for people yeah so. i just saw a post you put up with uh maybe six uh, fixed blade mm -hmm. knives, recurve, hollow ground, beautiful. I think you cut yourself on one of them. <laughs> yeah, I did. Uh, yeah, uh, really, really beautiful looking knives. Um, so, uh, Jim, thank you so much for coming on the show. And for patrons, we're gonna we're gonna continue this conversation a little bit uh, longer. I have a couple other questions I want to ask you. Uh, so, if you're interested in that, definitely check us out yeah. on Patreon. Um, otherwise, Jim, man, it was a real pleasure having you on the show. And to meet you and and to and to get just like I said, I knew it would only be the tip of the iceberg uh, from our conversation last night. I knew we would only get to that tonight. So uh, I really do appreciate you coming on the show, sir. Absolutely. Thank you. The honor. I appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Take care. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Jim Burke. Uh, I know I want that mechanic B, and I'm going to make that happen uh, sometime in the future. Obviously, it has to be the future, but I love that knife. And uh, I'm going to ask him a question about the Spidey Hole in that uh, Patreon uh, uh, interview. Uh, let me just say one thing that he mentioned that uh, always kind of pops up here is refining the process. No matter what you do, no matter what you do, 
It's all about refining the process. And if you're creative in any kind of way, that's that's where the real joy comes, I think. Uh, anyway, as Jim just flashed up, you can check us out on all the podcatcher uh, apps and then uh, check us out here next Sunday for another great interview. Of course, there's the Wednesday midweek supplemental where you get to hear about the knives in my collection. And then Thursday night knives, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time every week live here where we all get to get together and chat right here. Uh, so for Jim working his magic behind the switcher, uh, my name is Bob DeMarco saying until next time. Don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Knife Junkie.